Well, welcome and thanks so much for joining our conversation about the environment and New York communities. I'm Food and Water Action Executive Director Winona Howder, and we're so pleased to be joined this evening Stephen. by congressional candidates, Mandir That's the same and cabinet we have. Um, I, somebody I, I, is I, not muted. Yeah, if folks could just mute themselves as, as they get on. Um, and Claire, if you want to give me back the host trains, I, I can do that if you want. Okay, so we're really pleased to be joined this evening by congressional candidates, Mandir Jones and Jamal Bowman. And we're also glad to be joined by our Food and Water Action members from New York and from around the country. Please introduce yourselves in the chat box. You can do that by typing your name and where you're calling in from. So at the core of our current crises of COVID-19, racial injustice and climate change, is decades of institutionalized inequality, oppression, and violence. It's a failure of our nation's leaders who've let an inequitable system continue for far too long. At Food and Water Action, we mobilize people to reclaim their political power, to hold our elected officials accountable, and to resist corporate control. Our work is all about ensuring that everybody has the essential resources we all need to thrive. This is a fight we must win because this planet is the only one we're going to get. But we can't fulfill these goals with our current collection of elected officials in DC and in our state capitals around the country. That's why in the past few years, Food and Water Action has scaled up our engagement on elections. We need true allies and movement leaders in positions of power. This is the only way we're gonna stop catastrophic climate change and ensure that everyone has clean, affordable public water. Electing real champions is what we must do to ban factory farms and to create a more just and equitable food system. Our political work is continuing to grow and we are proud to have helped build our movement by electing movement leaders to state and local offices in New York, in Pennsylvania, and in California. In 2020, we're working to elect candidates to local, state, and federal offices around the country. We're going to keep oil and gas drilling out of environmental justice communities in California and Pennsylvania. We're gonna to move towards a just and sustainable food system in Iowa. Now, a national renewable economy by winning one election at a time. Just last week, we supported and helped elect a wave of new progressive mostly female climate champions in Pennsylvania. We also successfully defended incumbent champions, Summer Lee and Danielle Friel Otten. They both faced primary challengers who were bankrolled with hundreds of thousands of dollars from the fossil fuel industry because they had had the audacity to stand up for their communities against pipelines and fracking wells. Thank you to everybody on the call tonight who helped us in that fight. We're proud to endorse 
Mundir Jones and Jamal Bowman because they are leaders of our movement who will fight for what is right in Congress. Both of them will work hard to create millions of well-paying green jobs through a new green deal that bans fracking and all new fossil fuel infrastructure. They will check the power of the agribusiness industry that is responsible for exposing thousands of workers to COVID-19 and making the, pen, the next pandemic more likely. They will oppose water privatization because both of these candidates are going to fight for what's right. Mondeer Jones is running to represent New York's 17th Congressional District, which takes in the lower Hudson Valley counties of Rockland and Westchester counties. Mundair has been leading his community since he fought against inequitable school funding as a high school student. He's running in a crowded candidate field to fill the seat vacated by longtime Congresswoman Nita Lowry. Mondaire stands out as the clear progressive and he has a real shot at winning. Jamal Bowman is running to represent New York's 16th Congressional District, which takes in the Bronx and Westchester County. As a school principal, Jamal has fought for teachers, students, and families for 20 years. Now he's running for Congress to fight for working families in his community. Bowman is challenging con Congressman Elliot Engel, who has taken thousands of dollars from corporate PACs and has largely ignored his constituents. Engel has faced public ridicule recently for holing up in his home in the DC suburbs while the pandemic raged in his district where COVID first began to take its toll in New York. So now we're gonna move into questions. We're gonna start with questions to both candidates. And you each have three minutes to answer. Tell us why you're running and why food, water, and climate issues are important to you. Who's Mondaire, first? Do you 16 want to go or 17? <laughs> <laughs> Start with 17, work backwards? Sure. That's, that's, that's fine by me. Uh, first, let me just start by thanking all of you for joining uh, on an evening, on Monday evening, to hear from a candidate who most of you have not met, uh, at least in person. I, but I am grateful to see so many familiar faces, uh, including you, Jamal. I'm really proud that, uh, that you're running in this race as well. And look, you know, I'm running for Congress because for me, policy is personal. I grew up in Section 8 housing and on food stamps, and my young single mom still had to work multiple jobs just to put food on the table for us. Uh, so I know how important it is that we have uh, a living way, a minimum wage that works for everybody in this country at the federal level. She got help raising me from my grandparents. My grandfather was a janitor and my grandmother cleaned homes. And when daycare was too expensive, she took me to work with her. And now I get to run to represent the same people whose homes I watched my grandmother clean growing up. Uh, and when presidential, former presidential candidates like Elizabeth Warren uh, talk about providing universal child care in this country, uh, that's a fight that I want to join when I get to Washington. I'm part of a generation of people who are going to inherit a planet that will be devastated by climate catastrophe because people who have been in office for a really, really long time have failed to act with the kind of urgency that that issue requires. Uh, I'm the only candidate in my race who is talking about averting climate catastrophe in earnest, the only one who is advocating a Green New Deal that is not watered down uh, by you know some modifications that they've been offering, modest proposals uh, to, to deal with this existential problem that we have. Uh, and we have to go further uh, than what other people in this race, in my race, have proposed. We have to do, uh, as you mentioned, Winona, a complete ban on fracking and offshore drilling and the exporting of, 
of crude oil. I mean, we, we have to dream really big and fight tooth and nail for it to ensure a livable future. Uh, you know, I, I grew up living with food insecurity. And so I, it, it is not an abstract concept for me. Uh, but with the help of an entire community, I was able to make it from those humble beginnings uh, and, and getting a quality public education, frankly, in East Ramapo that doesn't exist anymore for too many public school students, 97% of whom are black and brown, 80% of whom, like myself, are eligible for free and reduced lunch. Um, I made it to Stanford University, got increasingly involved in progressive causes, uh, worked in the Office of Legal Policy at the Department of Justice under Obama uh, on criminal justice reform. It didn't take a national outcry for me to all of a sudden be talking about criminal justice reform. I've been centering that from the beginning of my race. Uh, then attended Harvard Law School and with my spare time went into Roxbury and Dorchester and provided free legal representation to people who looked like me and couldn't afford representation. Uh, made it to uh, work at a law firm in Manhattan for a number of years, co-founded a nonprofit that teaches professional skills to underserved middle school students uh, in three American cities, and more recently have been a lawyer for Westchester County. Uh, and, and, and the issues that you care about are my issues. Uh, these are issues uh, that are existential for too many folks. Uh, you know, when we think about food insecurity, I think of the fact that one of the reasons for the delay in school closures was because 114,000 kids are homeless and also rely on those public schools to provide them two to three hot meals during the day. Same is true right here in New York's 17th Congressional District in Westchester and in Rockland counties. Uh, and so I've really centered that, the kinds of structural changes that would actually improve the lives of everybody and not just a subset of the American population, even as my opponents talk about just getting rid of Donald Trump, which it is not enough to do. Because even before Donald Trump, people were really hurting. Uh, and that's why I'm running. So your opponents do that too. Talk about Donald Trump and every and every answer to any question, <laughs> like like institutional racism and food and water insecurity didn't exist before Donald Trump, right? This is a battle uh, we've been fighting our entire lives. So hello everyone, good evening. Uh, thank you so much uh, for joining us. My name is Jamal Bowman. I'm running for Congress in the 16th Congressional District. I decided to run for Congress because I was tired of children suffering and literally dying under the weight of poverty and trauma and bad policy that's come from Washington. You know, I've worked in public education for 20 years. 17 of those years I've spent in the Bronx. I started as an elementary school teacher before becoming a high school guidance counselor. And in 2009, I had the opportunity to become the founding principal of the Cornerstone Academy for Social Action Middle School. And as many on this call know, you are three times more likely to die of asthma if you live in the Bronx than anywhere else in the country. And, and this issue didn't become salient for me until I had a student uh, in middle school who suffered a severe asthma attack at home. And because her mom didn't know CPR, uh, she couldn't bring her back to consciousness. And she had to wait, the mother had to wait for the EMS to show up. And once they, you know, you know resuscitated the child and got into the ambulance into the hospital, the child had lost so much oxygen to the brain, she never regained her faculties and had to continue in rehab in the hospital for years on end. I didn't realize the impact of asthma until that horrible occurrence happened. And when you look at what's happening with COVID right now, you know, the disproportionate number of Black and Latino uh, individuals suffer from COVID because they suffer disproportionately from environmental racism and upper respiratory illness. Uh, it's what we're seeing throughout our district, particularly in the North Bronx, Yonkers, Mount Vernon, and New Rochelle. These are communities that have been under-resourced, that, that have been neglected, and are suffering disproportionately from this illness, as well as institutional racism and wherever it exists. Um, so in our school, you know, we did something that some would call innovative. I hired a horticulture teacher and the goal of that teacher and the job of that teacher was to teach our students the symbiotic relationship between themselves and the environment. And through that class, we started a local farming program where every summer we grow organic fruits and vegetables uh, for the community. And it's this type of thinking and this type of innovation uh, that we not only need in schools, we need it throughout our communities. You mentioned uh, factory farms, which are devastating the environment uh, across this country and around the world. 
So I support family farms and local farming uh, and investments there very strongly. Um, I also want to give a shout out to Jennifer Scarlett from North Bronx uh, Climate Justice. Uh, she was one of the first people I reached out to when I decided to explore a run for office. I wasn't quite there yet. Uh, this is before I met Justice Democrats. This was at the very beginning. And when I saw her work, I asked her, you know, I met her and I asked her to be like a, like a confidant, like a guy, like an advisor, someone to help me understand, you know, what climate justice looks like in this district in particular. And we drove around, we drove around the entire district. I took her to the Northeast Bronx. We went to Co-op City, you know, Co-op City, which is an amazing uh, cooperative in terms of low cost housing, you know, so it's a great city, but it also has um, a power plant burning fossil fuels right there next to Co-op City, which is providing energy, yes, but it's also why Co-op City has some of the highest asthma rates uh, in the entire city. So there's a lot of work to do. As you know, we're vulnerable on both sides, on the Henry Hudson side, as well as the Long Island Sound side. There's a lot of work to do there. Uh, our school is located in the Northeast Bronx, which is a food desert, and children deal with food insecurities on a consistent basis. So I'm excited to you know, start this work with all of you. I look forward to seeing Mon there on the other side in two weeks after we bring this home, baby. We are so close. I'm so excited. I'm so fired up. You know, we run an exciting uh, campaign on Dare has as well and looking forward to our work together. Great mm -hmm. answers. So I have a follow up question for both of you. You've both touched on it. Obviously, this conversation is taking place at a time that our country is in a major crisis. Not only do we have a racist president but we have systemic racism in our country. What do you think needs to happen right now, today? Yeah, I, I, I've been, as you might imagine, thinking about this a lot. Uh, it's been really tough. It, it has been particularly tough to be Black in America for the past two weeks. Uh, you know, the images on television and the stories from all corners of the United States uh, are, are constantly re-traumatizing, uh, except one silver lining at these rallies and, and, and protests, and I've been able to now attend five to 10 of those over the past week alone, is seeing so many white people at these rallies. When I'm in Irving, and when I'm in at very affluent Irvington, New York yesterday, and I'm seeing hundreds of, of white people rallying for black lives, I think to myself, here's an opportunity uh, maybe something's happening now that hasn't happened before where we're building the kind of movement required to obtain the reforms that we desperately need. Of course, that's happening in New York State today. Uh, I would make the argument that it should not have taken uh, the events of this past week and a half to, to accomplish that. I mean, this was legislation that had been proposed a long time ago. Repealing 58 was introduced in January 2019. And yet the two state legislators I'm running against my own primary only signed on to it after national protests. So we need better political leadership, even within the Democratic Party. Uh, nationally, we need to do um, federal standards in policing. Uh, we can do that through financial incentives and disincentives to the extent that there are constitutional uh, concerns about that. Uh, and we can make sure that these local municipalities are adopting those national standards. Uh, and eliminating chokeholds, requiring officers to identify themselves, things that make common sense, right? Um, making sure that people are engaging in de-escalation, which we know that uh, officers are, are far too willing to do when it comes to uh, uh, arresting white people. But when it comes to, you know, black and brown folks, they don't rely on that training that they, that they say they have that gives them special expertise. Uh, we have to make sure that we have independent oversight. Uh, in, in investigating and prosecuting instances of, of police killings of unarmed people. Uh, we have to make sure that we are having federal jurisdiction. If you're gonna take federal funds, then there needs to be, we need to make it a federal crime for, uh, for these unarmed killings to have occurred because there are too many states and local municipalities that are unwilling right now, especially in the South, uh, to, to stand up, but not exclusively in the South, of course. I mean, Minneapolis is not a Southern state, my goodness. Um, to, to, to stand up and do the right thing. We, we need to think of systemic racism more broadly than that. It, it's a public education system that relies on property taxes uh, and, and concentrates tens of billions of more dollars in white communities. 
it, it's a healthcare system that uh, conditions your access or your, your necessary medical care on your economic means, which disproportionately harms low income people in black and brown communities. Uh, so we have to make sure that we have a broad conception of systemic racism. It cannot just be confined to individual instances of police officers killing unarmed black and brown people in this country. And of course, we need to end mass incarceration and, uh, and, and legalize cannabis and, and, and defund the police. Winona, did you just ask us to cure racism in one day? I think your question <laughs> was right minutes. now, today. <laughs> Three gonna, minutes. <laughs> in three minutes, we have. Uh, you know, echo everything uh, Mondaire said. Uh, I also want to point to, to two particular areas. One at the federal level, uh, something called qualified immunity, uh, which doesn't allow civilians who have their civil rights violated by police to then turn around and sue the police. The police are protected uh, under this, under qualified immunity. That needs to be canceled, that needs to be ended. Uh, and we also need federal investigations, to my dear's point, by the DOJ and the FBI whenever police misconduct occurs. Uh, the police cannot police themselves, uh, and we definitely need uh, federal investigations there. You know, I also support defunding the police. And before, you know, people get up in arms, what does that mean? How are we going to survive without police, right? So to defund the police means to reallocate resources towards social workers, mental health professionals, counselors, uh, nurses, uh, teachers, and invest in the well-being and public health of our communities as opposed to the violent approach that is currently taken right now with the police department. Uh, and part of that defunding is also demilitarizing the police. Uh, you know, my opponent, Elliot Ingalls, supported the 1994 crime bill, which incentivized uh, states and police department becoming more militarized, uh, incentivize the building of more jails, incentivize private prisons. Uh, we need to demilitarize the police, defund the police, and refocus on working class people and the poor that we've neglected uh, for decades. Uh, in addition to transparency, you know, you talk about 50A on the state level, uh, we need a federal policy that increases police transparency so that we know uh, who we're hiring. hiring. Uh, we, we know their background in terms of uh, cases against them. Uh, and then finally, I want to echo something else one there say about standards. I think all police officers should earn a bachelor's degree and should continue with ongoing higher education if they're allowed to stay in their positions. Uh, and their training must be aligned to implicit bias and racial bias. Uh, we all have it. It's a disease that impacts everyone. Uh, but as we can see, it manifests in the police departments uh, on a consistent basis. Thank you so much. Well, next I'd like to introduce an incredible activist and elected official, uh, Vanessa Agudelo. Vanessa is a council member for the city of Peekskill, which is Mondaire's district. And she's the manager of member engagement at the New York Immigration Coalition. She has been a fierce advocate for immigration rights. She's tackling the climate crisis and fighting fossil fuel projects like the AIM pipe pipeline that runs so dangerously close to the retiring Indian Point nuclear facility. And already Vanessa has played a very important role on the Peekskill City Council in advocating for her community and has been a strong supporter in the organizing push against the Dan Scammer plant, which is uh, fairly close to her hometown. Vanessa is going to ask each candidate a question. Thank you so much, Winona, for that very lovely introduction. And thank you so much for having me here with you all. Uh, my question for both candidates are, um, climate change only further exacerbates the problems with this current administration immigration practices. Instead of investing in a Green New Deal, year after year, the US government spends billions on militarizing our borders and detaining and deporting our communities, some of who are climate refugees. Congressman Congress member Anita Lowy in particular as chair of the Appropriations Committee played a vital role in continuing to fund agencies that are terrorizing our people. 
can you commit to supporting a dramatic defunding of ICE and CBP? And what kinds of actions can you take to rally democratic leadership and government around this vital demand? Yeah, I, I'm, I'm, in, I'm in support of that. Um, Vanessa, you may recall that one of the reasons why I stepped out on faith and primary the chair of the House Appropriations Committee uh, is because she passed a budget that gave that increased the budget of ICE by 7% beyond the levels that have been approved by Republicans when they controlled the House of Representatives the year before. I think that Democrats, respectfully, Democrats in, in, in Congress have to be leveraging their majority more, much, far more aggressively. We see Republicans do that all the time. And so why can't we do it in a service of the best interests of the American people? Uh, in, terms of how to, in terms of how to rally people behind this, I think that it requires movement building. Uh, people who have been in office for a really long time, who've ascended to leadership roles within the, within the caucus in, in the House, uh, have to know that there will be consequences uh, when members of Congress who have been elected to do one thing fail to show the kind of political courage and meet the moment. Uh, and so for me, that looks like going into communities that have been shut out of the political process, uh, black and brown communities, low income communities, like the ones I grew up in, uh, and, 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 and speaking to their concerns, uh, not just showing up in an election, uh, but speaking to their concerns and-, and, and Oh, like Elliot Engel? Like Elliot Engel? <laughs> 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 Sorry, my bad, don't be to interrupt, go ahead. Uh, and and <laughs> bringing people into the fold to, to, to make sure that we are, are building upon this movement running people for office, my goodness, and supporting candidates who are gonna do the right thing. And again, holding people account. That means that we can't you know, scoff at primaries. Primaries are a good thing. Primaries are healthy for the democratic process. If you're worried about a primary, that means you're not doing the right thing. Uh, so that, that's, that's how we're gonna, we're gonna get the kind of accountability that we need. Yeah, uh, so we, we've been calling for the abolition of ICE uh, from the very beginning and a dramatic decrease in the funding of border control uh, from the very beginning and releasing children from cages and bringing families back together and, you know, opening up our arms to those who are seeking asylum in our country. At worst, it's a civil violation. It's not a crime when you're seeking asylum here, especially when you consider how much we've destroyed political and economic systems in Central and South America and all across the world. I mean, as we know, our military is one of the major contributors to global climate change and one of the major contributors to the refugee crisis uh, we see all over the world. So it's time for our country to be bold and to implement a 21st century Marshall Plan and lead on humanitarian grounds to rebuild everything we've destroyed over the last uh, several centuries. And to my dear's point, there are so many people who are impacted by this who are not in the fight as of yet. And we have, to, we have to go to them, we have to listen to them very carefully to understand what their realities are, and then we have to engage in movement building and organizing with them. It's similar to the work that I've done in education, uh, pushing back against standardized tests that were harmful to kids, uh, fighting for increased education funding, uh, and fighting to flip the border regions to make it more progressive. Movement building is gonna be key because we have to hold elected officials accountable, Democrat and Republican across this country. So we're not just gonna be move, um, building movements in the 16th and 17th, it's gonna be happening across the nation. And just centering human rights, equality and justice for all regardless. Like just keep it simple, it's not that complicated, but obviously when capitalism gets involved uh, it gets complicated for some people. But for us, it's about centering human rights, equality, and justice for all. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. And I just want to note how really exciting it is that we have two such amazing champions who are running literally in congressional districts next door to one another. And I can just see, because I know you both have an excellent shot at winning your elections, and it's going to be just thrilling for you to be able to work together as part of the New York delegation. So I think this is a, a, a very exciting uh, moment. So I am going to next 
have the pleasure of introducing Pat Houston, who is from New York Communities for Change. Um, New York Communities for Change has just been amazing allies of us in, in fighting the fossil fuel infrastructure, including uh, the recent win in the denial of the Williams Pipeline. And recently, Patrick has been a really important part of New York's movement for a Green New Deal, which advocates for an economically and racially just transition off of fossil fuels. So we are just so excited to partner with Patrick and NYCC in this important state and national campaign to fight back against the fa uh, fossil fuel industry. Patrick is going to ask um, a question now. For sure, thanks Winona. Um, hey y'all, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, oh. I'm there, Jamal, I'm heartened by y'all campaigns. Um, y'all may know New York Communities for Change has endorsed uh, both of your um, campaigns. And uh, I do wanna ask a question because we cannot miss a beat on the climate crisis. Um, so y'all know it's, it's no shocker that climate change impacts low-income communities, black and brown communities the most. Uh, fossil fuel infrastructure like the Gowanus frack gas plant, which is proposed in Brooklyn, um, and the Dan Scammer frack gas plant proposed just outside of Newburgh, um, which is just north of the 17th Congressional District, they're cited in poorer areas with heavy Latinx communities, heavy Latinx African-American populations, and it's polluting their air and it's polluting their water. And of course that air pollution doesn't have boundaries. Um, it contributes to poor quality air in the Bronx. Um, even Westchester County has an F rating from the American Lung Association. So you both oppose fossil fuel infrastructure um, I want to ask, can you speak more to this issue and how we can protect areas in New York and across the country from environmental racist projects like the Dan Scammer power plant, like the Gowanus proposed power plant? Yeah. Um, it, it, you, know, you know, so I support a Green New Deal, which calls for a complete ban on so many of this project, in fact, on all fossil fuel infrastructure. I mentioned earlier a ban on fracking and offshore drilling and exporting crude oil. But we have to, and, and, and I'm also reminded of the fact that in Peekskill, which, which Vanessa represents, you know, the, the, the rate, you have a large thoroughfare located there. These are all, every single decision that is made at a policy level is personal and has environmental impact. Uh, the, the rate of asthma is four times in peak scale what it is in neighboring Somers. Uh, and it is because you have an incinerator in the vicinity, you have this large thoroughfare. Uh, so these are all issues of environmental justice. Uh, as a policy matter beyond just ending fossil fuel infrastructure, I think that we need to be doing environmental justice analyses whenever decisions like this are being made. And I think that that should be attached to legislation. We, we, get, we get the fiscal impact, uh, that's that's scored by a number of independent organizations, including the Congressional Budget Office. Let's also talk about the environmental justice implications, environmental racism implications of any number of these decisions. Uh, and, and I think that should, that should be sort of a first principle whenever anything is being considered in the, in the area of, um, of, of locating any kind of infrastructure anywhere. But ultimately, my goal is to completely end fossil fuel infrastructure and, and completely decarbonize our economy, making sure that we are investing in, in green infrastructure and that those jobs are going to the people, largely black and brown and low income people who are being displaced from a decarbonizing economy, including right here in New York 17th Congressional District. I have projects in mind. I mean, wind and solar and the Long Island Sound and, and the Hudson River and also making sure that as we recognize that the transportation sector is the single biggest contributor to carbon emissions, uh, that we are investing in high-speed rail, solar powered, uh, to prevent people from in Rockland County where you currently have to drive or take a bus to get into the city or in Westchester are able to use public transportation, which is so much more environmentally friendly uh, than, than, than what we currently have. And of course, we have to make sure that we are standing as Congress members with the activists, uh, not just writing letters on letterhead, on congressional letterhead, 
was standing at press conferences and calling other elected officials and making it clear where we stand as, as elected officials using our Billy Pulpit, I think is super influential. Yeah, you know, I'm inspired by, you know, what happened with the Keystone pop Pipeline and how activists and organizers protested that days on end and stopped that pipeline uh, from being built. And I think organizers uh, across the city, across the state, across the country, and activists have to come to con together and continue to do that uh, whenever another pipeline is introduced, particularly in communities of color. And I think this moment where we're in right now, you know, coming off of COVID, coming off of the protests happening across the country, and to Mondeo's point earlier, this is an opportunity to look at institutional racism in all its forms. So not just police brutality, but environmental racism and how it exists and how it impacts our communities. Those are conversations we're, happening, uh, we're having already uh, in our district with regard to NYCHA housing and pushing for a Green New Deal in public housing to make sure we retrofit NYCHA and to make sure we build new social housing in alignment with uh, the net zero carbon emission goals we set for ourselves over the next 10 years. Because the conversation has shifted, it's, it allows us to bring more people into the conversation about environmental racism and all its forms and wherever they, it exists. So now that that mobilization is happening, it's more, gives us more of an opportunity to push back against things being built in the Bronx and uh, throughout Westchester as well. Thank you. I have a question for you, Mondeer. Mm -hmm. You've been an outspoken, um, you've outspokenly said that there are problems with uh, carbon taxes. And can you talk a little bit about your position on this issue? Yeah, you know, people who support a carbon tax mean perfectly well, you know, it, there's, it's no slight against them. I just don't think it's ambitious enough. And I think there's a reason why a carbon tax is not a feature of a Green New Deal. Uh, we cannot carbon tax our way out of climate catastrophe. We've got 10 years left before irreparable harm, according to that UN IPCC report. It's why I'm calling for federal mandates to end fracking, offshore drilling, exporting crude oil. I also think of myself as someone who grew up in a low income house. And, you know, the idea that um, BP and other oil, uh, oil giants who support a carbon tax, <laughs> which should be, you know, it's just sort of cue people in, well, okay, clearly they feel like this is something they can live with. Um, it, it, that, that, that they could just sort of pass off that cost to consumers, including low-income consumers, makes me very uncomfortable and distresses me. Uh, so I think that we need to mandate the decarbonization of our economy. Uh, and, we can, uh, and we can subsidize electric vehicles and that kind of thing for lower-income families in particular who are going to be need. I, I understand that some of that stuff is expensive, um, but, but that's where I think we ought to be going. I don't think we can rely on market-based solutions when it comes to climate catastrophe, not where we are right now. Uh, so that's my position on it. Again, it's no disrespect. I know that there are plenty of progressive-minded people who support a carbon tax. Um, I just think that it's not ambitious enough. Well, we appreciate that you don't support that false climate solution. Jamal, we fight water privatization because we know that water is a human right. And we know that providing safe, and affordable water for everyone requires federal funding. You've been an advocate for strong public schools and we see fighting against water privatization and the problems ed of education privatization as being very, very similar. Uh, can you talk about this? Yeah, it's, it's water privatization, it's privatization of public schools, it's privatization of our health care, it's continued privatization of our utilities. Uh, we're pushing back and fighting against privatization in all its forms. It's crazy that we're talking about water in this context, like it's water, like it's, 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 it's right there, it's available. Uh, and we need to make sure it's clean and safe to drink and, and all of those things, but Yes, it's, it's the, same, the same group of people, uh, the hedge fund billionaires, those on Wall Street, those are the same, the same people who are trying to privatize water, have worked to privatize uh, public schools through charter schools. Uh, they, they work to privatize uh, the healthcare industry through insurance. 
uh, th this is what they do. Um, and we've been able to fight and defeat them in the public school sector uh, by having a moratorium on charter schools across this country supported by the NAACP. And I don't think there's any way we're gonna allow them to privatize water under any, under any circumstances. Uh, it's, it's crazy that there's lead water in Detroit, um, in Flint, excuse me, and, and we all know about, uh, are aware of that, but there's lead, lead in the water right here in the Bronx, in our schools in the Bronx, and that didn't get the national attention uh, that it, it, it should have deserved. So uh, yes, it's, it's privatization is all its, in all its forms is what we're pushing back up against. Great. Mandir and Jamal, we'd like you both to speak for three minutes on how people can learn more about your campaigns and get involved. Yeah, uh, you're already doing it. You, 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 you're joining this Zoom event uh, and, and hopefully you like what you've heard. Uh, if you wanna learn more, please do visit my website. It's mondareforcongress.com, M-O-N-D-A-I-R-E-F-O-R congress.com. There's also a volunteer sign up sheet at the bottom of the homepage. That is the most important thing right now is to have your help phone banking and texting and friend banking, which is a form of relational organizing I became familiar with recently, where you go through your contacts, you use the reach app, which I think was really leveraged successfully by AOC, who has endorsed both of our campaigns as of this. Yeah, boy, yeah, boy. Shout out to AOC. <laughs> um, and, uh, and, and, and call people in your network who are Democratic voters in, our, in, this, in my district and, and make sure you tell them that you're supporting me because that is so much more personal than a mail piece that they would receive from a candidate they've never met or even a television ad that's on air right now. Uh, and so I need your help doing that. It's how we're going to be victorious. Uh, I, I heard yesterday that Mr. my billionaire opponent, Mr. Slifer, has a poll that, uh, that shows me surging past him. Uh, and so, you know, we, we can accomplish this on June 23rd. In fact, right now, if you're in Westchester, you've already been voting by absentee. Rockland voters have just started to receive their absentee ballots. Uh, so there's a real opportunity and we cannot miss it. This is a moment when people I'm seeing all over social media and in my private conversations are saying that we need more people like you in Congress. In the midst of racial unrest, we need your leadership. You can't predict stuff like this in our politics or in American history, but you certainly have to use it as an opportunity to educate people about why it is that you uniquely are the one who should be representing that district. And I'm grateful for the opportunity and hopefully grateful for your support. We are two weeks away. We are two weeks away. Like, I can't believe I'm saying that. It's, it's, it's incredibly humbling. It's incredibly exciting. I feel like our campaign is ascending and, and hitting a crescendo at the perfect time. You know, being here tonight with Mondaire and, and just looking aesthetically at how different, you know, Congress would look uh, in this state if the two of us were able to pull out this victory. Um, Elliot Engel gave us a, an amazing gift from God last week uh, with this hot mic moment. Um, and we've taken advantage of it on the inside of the campaign and we're, and we're running with it. So we're, we're two weeks away. Um, we need everyone, everyone to get involved in some way, shape or form. Uh, the, the, the voters have been excited about us from the very beginning. They're even more excited now because they're clear on where Elliot Engel stands. He wasn't here during the pandemic. And when he, when he returned, he said, if I didn't have a primary, I wouldn't care. So that tells you all, all you need to know about my opponent. We're very excited. We're two weeks away. Bowmanforcongress.com. Click on events. Help us with phone banking, postcard writing. We're going to be doing some lit drops over the next uh, couple of weeks. But we're right here. Early voting has started. Um, you know, the early polls open, I think, this weekend. Uh, and... Uh, yeah, you know, June 23rd is the final day of voting and this, this you know, we could, we could make history, knocking out a 31 year incumbent uh, who's lived in Maryland for 27 years and uh, really pushing a progressive agenda in all its forms. And my background, Mondea's background, like we, we're gonna fight tooth and nail for the rest of our lives to center working class people and the poor. That's what we're all about. That's never changing no matter what. So. 
support us, help us get there so we could turn Congress upside down in a good way. Thank you so much. I'm gonna turn it over to Sam Bernhardt now, who is the political director at Food and Water Action. Hey all, um, thanks so much for hanging with us through some technical difficulties. Um, to our members who couldn't get on, on the line, um, we've heard from 20 or, uh, or so folks who, who couldn't get on. Thanks for watching this, uh, the, 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 the taped version of this. Um, I just wanted to quickly uh, tell folks uh, how Food and Water Action is supporting these amazing candidates. Um, so we have um, the people power. Um, Jamal Mandare, NYIC Action, um, New York Communities for Change, and Food and Water Action, we're all here because we believe that the way to change um, our, our lives um, is to build people power. Um, our opponents, they have corporate money. And the bad news is we can't use that people power like we usually do to have lots of in-person conversations through door knocking and canvassing. Um, but the good news is, um, well, as you all just heard, um, the campaigns have developed their own ways to, um, to reach out to people even in the middle of a pandemic. Um, and Food and Water Action isn't um, allowed to, to work with them on, uh, on, on those outreach um, mechanisms, uh, but uh, uh, what what our team is doing is um, so we've developed a team of uh, food and water action volunteers who've been hard at work handwriting letters to voters, asking them to to to, to support um, uh, these amazing candidates. Um, handwritten letters aren't just uh, socially distant uh, electioneering tactics. Research actually shows that they work. That there's something about getting a letter. Um, uh, that we know someone took the time to sit down and write um, that makes us more likely to vote and, and to vote for them. Um, and uh, when Nona mentioned our work in Pennsylvania, we our, our team of, of volunteers wrote about 2,000 letters in support of um, one of our endorsed candidates in uh, Pennsylvania, Summer Lee, um, who uh, won her re-election last week. And we're on pace to far exceed that amount of handwritten letters in our outreach to New York voters um, for this upcoming primary. So thanks to everyone who has gotten your writing muscles in shape to help elect these climate champions to join the team. Um, you can sign up at the link that uh, Santosh, the real Santosh, again, technical difficulties, it seems everyone is named Santosh Nandabalan. Um, <laughs> um, but, uh, um, uh, one of the Santoshes will, will chat the, the, the sign up link and um, uh, you can join the team by signing up there. Um, and we're having our next letter writing training and, and letter writing uh, call where we just write letters together this Thursday at 7 p.m. So you'll get information about that as well. Thank you very much. Thank you. And best of luck. Thank, Thank you. you so we much. We know you're going to win. Yes, with your help. Good night, everyone. Yes. Good night, y'all. Good night. Peace and Good love. Good night.